Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. This is Jeremiah's J Man Monero, J Man Seminars with Millennial Who Talks, episode number 18, changing lives with real stories from real estate rock stars from across the country. We're here with Chris. Is it Jermaine? Am I saying it correctly? Jermaine, yeah. Yeah, man, I got it right. <laughs> you got it right. From the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. So we always like to start out with telling everybody how to like and share the millennial who talks. So if you hear something that you like today, please tag one of your, you know, somebody you care about enough to share good information with them, uh, share it on your pages, but you can also subscribe to our, our podcast or the millennial who talks by typing millennial who in the comments below, just millennial who you'll be contacted by our messenger bot. He says, please say yes. And then you will only be contacted next time we're going live. No spam, nothing like that whatsoever. So let's get right into it with Mr. Chris Germain from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I'm feeling you today because we have this Bombo Genesis weather going on today. It's a, <laughs> it's a word I learned today about some kind of weather pattern storm that we're having. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we, uh, we're we not getting any of the snow, as, as weird as that is in my area in the Upper Peninsula. Um, we hardly get any snow, not the case for the rest of the Upper Peninsula, but we're sitting at like 10 degrees right now and uh, I'm not having that. <laughs> a balmy 10 degrees. Yeah, yeah. I was just in the Dominican recently. Uh, that's why I didn't respond right away when uh, you were setting up these videos. Um, I'd much rather be back there, uh, at least for another week. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. I've been there. It's great. It's great. So <laughs> Jim, Jim says in Michigan, we call it spring. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. All right, so let's start with you know who you are. When you when you started, well, we know who you are already. But when you started in real estate, how old were you? What prompted you to get into real estate? All that good stuff. Um, so I kind of came from a little bit of a, a mixed family. Uh, my mom was always in business. Uh, my dad was a blue collar worker um, on the pipelines, especially on the uh, Millennium Project pipeline, which came into the United States from Canada. Um, so with my mom being in business, um, I was always kind of drawn to that aspect of uh, my life. You know, I always kind of um, felt right and felt natural to be in business or, or kind of drawn to that. Uh, I wouldn't say a better lifestyle because we work so many hours, <laughs> but you it's just a completely different lifestyle. And we talk about how the entrepreneurs will work 90 hours to avoid a 40 hour work week. And that's exactly uh, the kind of lifestyle I was drawn to. So um, my original destination in, in life was actually law enforcement. Um, and, okay. and everything happens for a reason. Um, I obviously was not meant to go in that career three months before I graduated high school. Um, I got in a car wreck that altered that career path. Um, I wasn't able to go into law enforcement, unfortunately, uh, maybe fortunately. Um, and the only other thing I had thought about was business. And uh, I saw that a local company was uh, hiring realtors. They had an ad in the paper. So I went and talked to them and said, hey, what does this actually take? Um, that was when I was 22 years old. Um, and I've been in the industry since, uh, going on 14 years uh, later this year. So uh, been in the industry for a while and, and enjoyed every minute of it. Kind of got in when everything was uh, crashing, really. Um, so those four, first few years were, <laughs> it's like, man, what did I get myself into? <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is awesome, this real estate market, yeah. right? <laughs> this gig is great. <laughs> I, I could definitely see the law enforcement look. You look like somebody who pulled me over recently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know why I was speeding. I didn't see you, officer. <laughs> like, what do you want? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I get that a lot. I've actually had uh, over the past two years, I've had probably five different people that thought I was a police officer um, when I met them on different occasions. And um, it, not the case anymore, but yeah, the, the bald head and the, <laughs> you know, you kind of get that look um, that people right. expect. Right, Stephanie, look, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so let's talk about 22 years old. I remember when I was 22, it's like you just feel like you're invincible, you could do anything, and then you got into the market here when it was raring to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the place down right. How how was it during the crap during that time? I know, like Detroit, we had somebody on the show not too long ago from Detroit, but you're a little bit right. further north of there. How was that? Was it just as bad, or what was it like? Not as much. It's it's not. Um, so the Upper Peninsula. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but it is uh, 
peninsula <laughs> peninsula wide um there's 300,000 people uh give or take so our economy is um very much self-sustained um the only company really in my area that was affected by the um auto companies crashing which detroit would have felt obviously um, way more than we would have was a company called emp that makes some components for ford motor company Okay. Um, but they also had military contracts and, and different things like that. So they, they laid off people, um, but not to the extent that you saw in lower Michigan. So with us not being so dependent on the auto industry jobs, that actually helped us. Um, you know, our, our jobs are always our jobs, um, and they don't seem to fluctuate much. Unfortunately, we could use more. Um, right. and you could use like a, a larger industry to come in here, but because we weren't dependent on such a uh, large company, um, we didn't have that failure that other areas did. Our prices fluctuated and people uh, didn't buy as much as they do when the economy is good, but the people that worked at say, uh, you know, that were left at EMP at the time, or uh, we have like a local paper mill, those those folks still had secure jobs and were, were buying and selling. Um, so that helps when you're when you're not so dependent on one industry. Yeah, I would imagine it, you were the steady eddy, like it's similar to our market where we saw it for years. We never saw this huge, you know, boom that everybody else did. So we were less affected by the bust. Um, well, right. Tell us though, like that first year, what did you have a mentor, somebody helping you, a managing broker, or was it just like, hey, Chris, here's your phone? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, where I started and, and where I am now are, are kind of two different places. Now, I, I kind of applied, um, like I talked about, that that business side of me and, um, you know, kind of took what I saw uh, maybe my mother do in different industries and applied it to real estate. So that helps a little bit. But as far as formal training, um, like a lot of companies out there, it, it left a lot to be desired. Um, so I bought, uh, you know, different real estate books that I thought might be interesting. Um, and they weren't any mainstream books. They were just kind of like, Hey, tips from this broker or, um, you know, ways to promote yourself. And, um, that kind of fueled the, uh, the way that I started in the business. And then it was just kind of a trial by error. Um, you know, like as I, as I went through what, uh, what worked, what didn't and, and kind of altered from there. And then, uh, slowly got into more real estate classes and, and things like that, that then helped guide me a little bit better on, on what I was doing. Um, one of the first classes that I took uh, was the ABR class, um, which being newer in the industry was a phenomenal class to take. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't ready for you to stop. I was mid, mid drink, but <laughs> look how he stopped so quickly. All right. So, I mean, what was the first year like? Did you, you were you struggling to begin with? Like you're saying, like with the guess and check method, that could always be expensive because it's like, okay, let me try this. It doesn't work. And then at the meantime, you like, you need to make money. So right. It, it, what, what was that like? So, you know, you have a lot of people that get into this industry and, and for whatever reason, they think we make $200 an hour okay. or we're making money, whether we sell or not. Um, and, and it's a struggle, you know, I mean, it's expensive to get into the industry in a way, um, if you're not prepared for like, say, even just your realtor fees and your MLS fees and your advertising costs, if you don't have a real good grasp on what you're getting into and you're not prepared well, um, that certainly could uh, hinder the way that you're um, gonna spend your first year. My first year was pretty rough. Um, I, I was looking at the economy <laughs> as a factor, um, not being well known. I, I knew a lot of people, but I was 22 years old. A lot of people that I knew at that time were not buying houses. You know, like now I'll get a lot of uh, 18, 19, 20 year old clients, uh, but not back then, not when the economy was suffering. And um, it really uh, took a toll on that first year. It was about five months before I had my first um, my first sale. And uh, I always like telling people this because the, the big old check that I got was one hundred and thirty eight dollars and twenty cents. Um, I sold a uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I can eat for a week. Yeah, <laughs> but I can get some gas. That's great. Right. <laughs> um, it was a mobile home um, that was on a rented lot, and it had a minimum commission of, of just zilch, and uh, that was my portion. 
Uh, fortunately, a week later, um, I had another sale and my check on that one was $3,900. So that, that made it a little bit better. But, um, you know, for people that are really getting into the industry and expecting this instant success, and that's, that's one of the things that I, I think is truly misinformed about our industry. Um, people do expect um <laughs> Baller status. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, I like Jim already. He's a funny guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, people expect that instant success. And if they're really not prepared for what the industry truly is in the way that you have to market yourself and the way that you have to be out there hustling a lot of the times, um that comes as a shock. And that's where we get that influx and outflux of people in our industry. Um, which is unfortunate. I think if we if we prepared a little bit better or um, I talked about this at the Michigan Realtors, if if we really presented the real estate industry as a legitimate business to get into, I don't think people think of it that way. And that's really unfortunate. I think if um, we could kind of work with uh, the local community colleges and, and develop some type of programs or some types of internships so people can really see what the industry is about, um, I've been talking to uh, a, a gentleman that just turned 21 in this area, and I think he would be phenomenal in the industry, but I, I don't think he's going to go into it because I don't think he thinks he can make a, a legitimate career out of it. Um, so it's something as an industry as a whole that I think we need to work on. Yeah, and, and I think you bring up a lot of good points, and I'm going to say shout out to HGTV for <laughs> uh, putting that image out there that we, you know, you know, even as you get your license, all these checks are rolling in. They appreciate your honesty and saying, look, it took it. My first six months was a struggle. I was eating Raymond noodles. Here's my picture, my hundred and whatever, $68 check or whatever it was. You know, right. because then if some, if somebody can plan for that, I think that's, that's the message. And what you're saying is like, we all want to be successful. And then you do your business plan and, and, but what if, what if that first six months doesn't go as planned? If you, if you plan for it, then you're going to do all right. But if you go into like, no, I'm going to make money off the, right off the bat. Cause I got the gift of gab and I'm the best salesperson ever. Right. right? Yeah. And if they're just not prepared, um, you know, I always tell people if um, they got to think like at least six months, you know, I go, I, there, there's been months where I have made thousands of dollars and there are months where I've made zero, you know, and I always try to tell that I had a friend that got in the industry. He was in for four months um, and, and didn't get a sale, got discouraged and was out of there. Um, they really just, uh, you know, you need to put it in perspective, talk about the, the planning that you're going to have for business, talk about um, what your contingency plan is. If you're not making the money, um, are you going to be able to meet your bills for the, for the next few months without a check? Are you going to be able to, pay for the marketing on the house that you just listed. Um, you know, uh, again, uh, we're, we're certainly not making $200 an hour. It can be, um, but it's not constant $200 an hour for every hour that you're sitting in the office. And I think that's where it takes place. And you get these eager uh, uh, making that I lost you there for a second you a little bit I don't know if uh, oh I think so there yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna assume that what you said was really outstanding because sometimes we lose each other but if you're listening now and you could hear us and everything's okay, just comment in the sections below. Let's see here. Chris, you still there? I'm still here, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. I don't have an audio of you. I'm sorry, I have audio, but not video of you. Oh, but I could, oh that's awesome. Yeah. Was, as long as you can hear me. <laughs> At least I can hear you, though. Yeah, as long yeah. as you can hear me, that's fine. First year, like, how, how did you progress from that first year and you know with your business and take it to the next level get into leadership and and all that like how how did what was the progression like and what prompted you to to get into leadership and all that so with uh leadership for me i i kind of looked at it as if i if i can be involved in the industry leadership is 
that that would only help me out in the long run because if you surround yourself by knowledgeable people, um, you're going to be able to pick up on their knowledge and kind of share off of one another. And, and I think that's really one of the big things um, for leadership. Not only are you going to help shape in that, but you're also going to be able to surround yourself by the best of the best and be able to uh, feed off of them and, and their energy and kind of put that right back. Um, when I first got into real estate, I got on my local MLS board. Now the UP is a little bit unique. Uh, underneath that organization is five individual MLSs. Um, so I got first on the local MLS board, which is countywide here. Um, and then six months later, um, somebody had left the board of directors that the filter that be involved with that process that original board at such a young age and be experienced from outside of the real estate industry into them all separate kind of move along with uh, working on. when I first got on that board I mean data sharing was such a huge uh, conversation and um, you know we look at it today and, and see the uh, the companies that have come on of truly uh, um, you, you know those conversations were extremely important um, for years ago on how we were going to handle her uh, as I as I got further along along is uh, me on uh, um, so I was actually on a big day and uh, to sit in a room with some of the largest brokerage owners uh, in the state of Michigan, and, and it was phenomenal to uh, be a part of that conversation. Uh, Stefan Swanepoel uh, was was there as well, and um, the knowledge that that he has um, was just amazing to sit there for an afternoon and, and be able to ask questions of him and talk to him. So, you know, I always evolved. And you never know where it's going to take you. You never know what room it's going to put you in, um, and who you're going to be sitting with. Um, since then, I've, I've sit on two Michigan Realtors boards, um, the, uh, the YPN, the Young Professionals Network Board, um, and then also on the uh, Michigan Realtors Leadership Academy, uh, which would be a part of the, the I was um, And from there, then I actually became the, the co-facilitator, and uh, I'll have one more year in that position. And uh, then I'll have to move on from that. But it was, uh, it's, it's been um, great with that Michigan Realtors uh, Leadership Academy. You're sitting one on, or not one on one, but 14 um, with one national speaker. Um, so, you know, again, that knowledge that you can get from, from having that intimate of a session with a national speaker uh, is phenomenal. So getting involved, even if it's just on your local board and working your way up from there, I highly encourage it. Um, people who, so, I mean, we have, um, amazing opportunities for referrals perhaps. Um, and I never would have met, uh, folks like Jim if I wasn't involved and I wasn't going down to the, the Michigan Realtors conventions and, and sitting on these boards. So let me ask you this. How old were you when you first got into leadership? Like your first position that you, uh, uh, did you get a, appointed or elected right off the bat or was it a multiple time kind of situation because i know that's always that can be a challenge depending on the your board size and and the leadership and who is it um i i caught most of that question you will cut out a little, little bit um but i so i got involved um within six months on the local mls committee and then it was probably about a year into my real estate career when I got involved on the Upper Peninsula Realtors. Um, I was on the Upper Peninsula Realtors for, um, I believe, 
where I got um, elected into uh, the vice president position. Um, and on our board at that time, it was vice president, president elect, and president. Now, um, we go off of a different model than most. We do two years for each position. So that was a six year um, time commitment to that. Um, but it, it's absolutely worth it. And the, the way that you can make those connections, especially once you're in the, the president's seat, um, working with the affiliates, promoting the organization, promoting what we can do as realtors for communities. Uh, there's so many opportunities for people there if they get involved in the board of directors and, and are fortunate enough to become an officer of that board. So how, how much time are you talking about here as far as all of your volunteer activity? So, uh, this, but you're also a fireman. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, I, one of my things is I always like to um, give back to the community that gives me so much. Um, I live, uh, I, or I lived in Ford River. Um, I grew up in Ford River and then uh, I uh, moved into the city of Escanaba. They're about seven miles apart. And uh, Ford River Fire Department is one of the time, or one of the areas that I serve. Uh, my community that I grew up in, uh, as well as the city of Escanaba with that. Um, the fire department takes up quite a bit of time uh, because uh, you can get called out at any time. So it's a it's a 24 hour, seven day a week um, thing. Now, if you can't respond to a call, then it's no big deal. It, it is a volunteer department. Uh, but on that department, I serve as the captain and the training officer. And um, the amount of time that you spend in classes and that you spend training other um, firefighters, uh, getting those cert uh, those firefighters certified and also um, training other departments in the county. So um, every year, um, because of state funding, it's a, it's a little bit uh, different, but every year in our area, um, we have a challenge to the state test. Um, so leading up to that, there is no classroom time. So it falls back on the departments. And because we do um, so much training and two of our officers, myself and, and one other, are so involved uh, with, with um, what it takes to train, all the departments send people to us to get trained. So we'll train the, um, the local public safety department, their police and fire. Um, we'll train uh, neighboring fire departments, their new members. Um, so it does take a great deal of time. Um, but when you are putting that kind of time in, you get these connections again with other people. Your entire department is in, in your sphere. So, you know, you have right. uh, folks that you can uh, potentially have as clients later. You know, um, some of the police officers that I've trained have come back and, and purchased houses through me. So, um, as you give back to your community, you know, I kind of look at it as a model of, of community first. Um, when you're giving back to the community that gives you your business, uh, when you're spending time volunteering or making your community better, um, it shouldn't be about getting those benefits, um, but there's benefits that come with that. You know, you, you focus on the community first and will help grow your business um, as a, a positive note in, in the end. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, people who do volunteer work just to do volunteer work and say, hey, look at what I did. Um, that's different. You know, people that truly care about their community and can, are, are truly investing that time. Um, I think that makes a, a whole uh, world of difference. Well, and I think the common theme we've had with almost everybody that we've interviewed with these millennial who talks is successful agents doing great things, but everybody gives back. Everybody Absolutely. cares about their community. And it's almost like what comes first, the, you know, the chicken or the egg. And I almost think like, if you start caring about your community, you start doing good things. It's just the, the law of reciprocation is good, right? I mean, you put enough goodness into the, into the world, it, it has to come back to you. And like you said, at some point, the fireman and they're like, hey, Chris, what do you do anyways besides <laughs> this, right? And you're like, well, I sell real estate. Let me help you. Man, it just, it's bound to happen. Yeah, what absolutely. Tell, tell us more about the Leadership Academy in Michigan. Is that something that that people apply for? Is it awarded? What's, I know it is. in New York State, it's a little different, but. Okay. Yeah. So um, the first year they selected 14 realtors from across the state um, in, in 
the idea behind it is uh, everybody does have to apply. Uh, they have to come in with letters of recommendation and fill out paperwork in regards to um, what, what they've currently done as a leader and why they want to grow. Um, we will select no more than 14 people each year, though we're not required to um, select 14. I think this time out of all the applicants, um, I believe we selected 10. We only felt like 10 actually met truly what we were looking for. Um, so it's not just handed out. It is competitive um, and, and people are kind of vying for those seats because they, they want to be able to spend the time with those national speakers. Um, develop their skills. We we spend uh, one of the sessions um, in Chicago at the National Association of Realtors, um, the Chicago Association of Realtors, um, at the the Tech Lab, which if you've never gone, is absolutely awesome and our um, and we get uh, people kind of exposed to these um, different components of what NAR. Uh, really does, but also talk to them about the leadership roles that exist in the state of Michigan and on the national level and, and really try to foster that um, leadership and in, in where they're going to go next after um, after the leadership academy, you know, like what committees are you going to get on or, or what's your end game? Do you want to do you want to become an officer of the Michigan Realtors or do you want to be a director? Do you want to sit on the RPAC board um, and really try to help foster that and get them to that goal in the end? So if you're a new agent watching this and you're from the state of Michigan and you're interested in getting into leadership, I would. What would they do? Go to the state's state site or just Google Michigan Leadership Academy. It should come up or maybe you'll post the link in the comments below. How about that? Yeah, we could do that. Um, and the the um, filing deadline has passed for this year. We, we've just selected um, actually in uh, in late December um, or I'm sorry, early December. We selected the uh, Leadership Academy for this coming year. Um, but yeah, the Michigan Realtors uh, website would have that information for 2019. Uh, the deadline will usually be in November uh, for them to apply for the following year. Um, and then is, if, if somebody's looking to get involved, I mean, uh, the best is to try to um, get on either your local MLS committee, um, your regional board, even if you can serve on a committee um, with your board, even if it's a local committee. Um, that at least starts the process. And, and the more you're, you're seen at events and the more that you're seen at conventions, that really helped um, with me. Uh, I, I really believe that was one of the uh, reasons I was offered the PEG um, under Gene Spinsky when he was president is because um, my earpiece keeps sliding out. <laughs> um, but uh, it was because I was at so many events um, at the Michigan Realtors level. And um, our board up here as the Upper Peninsula Realtors is really great at fostering that aspect of things. We, we want our entire board to be at Achieve, um, which is one of the Michigan Realtors events. And a lot of boards will only send their uh, president and president elect. We send the entire board um, because we want that exposure and we want our board to be able um, to achieve positions on the statewide level, because like anything, there's there's an element of politics to it. And uh, in order to make sure that your area is represented, um, you need to have people from your area sit on those committees and those boards. And um, we're fortunate enough um, that that the um, Michigan Realtors president, the, the, the immediate uh, past president from 2017 was actually from the Upper Peninsula, um, Jason Copeman. And he was the first um, first president uh, from the Upper Peninsula of the Michigan Realtors. So that was uh, a great to see. And um, Stephanie Jones, who uh, sits on the local Upper, Upper Peninsula Realtors board, um, has a national director seat. Um, and I sit on those two Michigan Realtors Academy, uh, the Academy and the YPN board. So um, we, we've done a good job at being able to make sure that at least the Upper Peninsula has some voice on the statewide level. And um, sometimes those perspectives of being from a smaller area do make a difference when, when the statewide discussions are taking place. Well, and at least you have a seat at the table and know what's going on and you're involved. And yeah, that's, that's really good. So let's talk about balance then being all, like you said, it takes the, 
your volunteer activities, but just the fire department, I would imagine, take up a ton of your time. But then you have, you know, you're involved with leadership and, and real estate. And then you you have to sell some houses every once in a while. Right. <laughs> so, like, how do you find the balance between it all? Like, how, how do you get it all done? I would imagine that if you're listing a house, you can't go help save somebody from a fire or like, how does that all work? You know, with, <laughs> with everything that you're doing. Um, so yeah, it, it, it hasn't happened often, but um, <laughs> every now and then I do get paged while I'm uh, either listing a house or showing a house, depending on who the client is. Um, you know, being in a, a smaller community, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, that small community feel to it. So depending on who the client is, I've had clients go, you know, you need to leave. Uh, go respond to that call, take care of that, and we'll set this right. up for a different day. Um, some clients aren't like that, you know, and, and if they're not like that, then I will continue to show the house and, and just uh, go on with these business. And, and if I get a chance and the fire is still active, um, I'll head out there later. Um, so it, it kind of depends on the client in that regard if you're paged out while that's happening. But um, as far as balance, you know, people, that's another thing that I think is is a mistake in our industry is, um, yeah, we're always, we're all busy, we're always moving, we're always hustling. Um, and you do have to have a little bit of a balance. You do got to give yourself a break. And, and so many times you hear about people in the business where they kind of get that, that bad reputation of um, they're all business all the time, they're never taking a break. And, and I can think of a couple of realtors that are like that too. Um, for me, um, and it's and it's not any specific religious purpose, but for me, um, Sunday is pretty much my day, um, if at all possible, to just say I can't show any houses, at least to give me a little bit of a break um, on that week, um, focus on stuff that I need to get done around my house, um, and then start the next week um, off after that little break. So. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in a lot of different places um, is if somebody wants you to show a house at a certain time and, and you got like, uh, if you have kids, if you have a kid's birthday party or something like that, don't skip it. Just say that you have an appointment at that time. They don't need to know the appointments with yourself um, or your family and, and allow that to just be a different day, you know, um, and you know, all the realtors that I know that talk about that, they say that gives them a lot more uh, flexibility and they haven't really lost any clients over it. Um, it's easier to say, I have an appointment than to say, well, I have this birthday party. So if you just say, yeah, I got an appointment, uh, can we do uh, the following day at three o'clock instead? Um, and most clients will, will go with that. So um, people have to uh, definitely take some time to, to focus on family and themselves and their friends. Um, you have very limited time here. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, at a young age, I lost both my parents and, and my business came second uh, to spending time with them when things were getting really bad with them. Um, and I don't regret any of that uh, because you'll never get that time back. You can always get business back. You can always rebuild your business, but you're not going to be able to get the time back with your family. Um, and one of the other things that I talk about kind of with a, a little bit of a unique perspective with um Firefighting is um, when realtors are complaining about their day. And I said, you know, I, I get it. There's high stress. Um, our job is not easy, especially when a deal is getting uh, close to um, closing and, and something's going horribly wrong and we're scrambling and trying to fix it. If that deal falls through, it's it's awful. Um, you might be counting on that money, but you're, you're still here, you're still alive. Um, the bad day that we have in real estate is completely different than the bad day um, that I could have on the fire ground. Um, so a bad day on the fire ground might mean that somebody passed away um, or we weren't able to save a life or we weren't able to get somebody before they were seriously injured. Uh, where a bad day in real estate might mean I lost some money. Um, so to try to keep things in perspective um, and really focus on the important things in life, community and family, uh, while keeping that balance with work. So making sure that you um, keep that perspective is a great thing. And, and making sure that you have an appointment with yourself um, to be able to relax, to be able to um, spend time with whoever you want, have that little bit of release from, from working constantly. Yeah, I mean, 
really brings up some great points. Nobody at the end of their life, they're sitting in their deathbed says, oh, I wish I would have listed just one more house, right? I mean, right. It, in the end, it's like family first. That's what you have. And I could definitely empathize with you. My, my, uh, my wife, her, she lost both of her parents at a young age and her brother, a couple, you know, a couple of years later. So it's, it's definitely tough. And we treasure that. It's like, you have those moments, you put it in the calendar. I will, you know, you don't tell the doctor, well, that time doesn't work for me. The doctor tells you that his availability, right? So I right. think we need to, just like you said, think of it, thinking of it like a business and a profession where people respect our time, not just, oh, well, you could just show me a house anytime because that's what you do. You need to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, ah, uh, no, no, nope. sorry. So in closing, so we're getting close to our, a little bit past our 30 minutes here, but we always close with uh, advice for the young Christopher starting at 22 <laughs> years of age, bright eyed and bushy tailed, you know, or even just a new agent starting out. What kind of advice would you give him, given the expertise, the knowledge, the leadership training that you've had now over the years uh, to help him or them be more successful in the future? <laughs> uh, so one of the big things for me uh, when I first started is um, you, you always uh, try to please everybody. Um, and you're, you're really working towards um, getting that sale and you, and you really don't focus on the big picture or at least I didn't. Um, so I would constantly be showing uh, people like 10 houses, all of a sudden 15 houses and, and you're, you're spending all this time spinning your wheels where if you would have um, taken some time to sit down with them ahead of time, really interview them well and, and really understand truly what they're looking for. Um, so you're not wasting your time or making sure that they're pre-qualified. Um, you have a lot of um, agents even still that I see that, that jump up and, and run um, after a deal. You know, I might meet somebody perhaps once um, before I kind of run them through an interview process. Um, but doing that initial uh, talk through with people and, and making sure they're pre-qualified and making sure that you're really showing them what they're looking for. A lot of people see a picture on the MLS or, or whatever. Um, and, and all of a sudden that's the house they want. That's, that's the one, but you really, if, if you're going off of just that, then you're spinning your wheels and you're not really looking, you know, and, and understanding, do they need a, a basement because of storage space or, um, do they have to have that garage? Do they really need to prefer to be in the country versus in the city? So, um, kind of slowing down, interviewing people and, and not, um, letting them control the the transaction or the the conversation and you kind of getting ahead of that and and kind of taking control and figuring out what they're truly looking for because that's the best way we're going to be able to help somebody is is um, when we know the full picture and what their end game is on what they're trying to achieve with their house purchase um, is really truly how we're going to help them we're not helping them when we're just jumping up and, and showing them every picture that they find attractive if that makes uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So I would just to summarize it, maybe say get to know your client better. Yeah. Or, right. Technology these days, I think years ago, pre MLS, when they had, you know, the book, the, the boxes of cards and everything like you had to go out and show them houses and physically drive around. And, but with Google Maps and videos and everything else that we have you know, and like you said, get to know them a little bit better and what they're looking for. The more time you spend in the office, the less time you'll spend out, you know, out, out right. in the middle. Of, <laughs> and what we're, I'm going to plug this word again, in the middle of bombogenesis, <laughs> which is what I got to share this, is an explosive psych, cyclogenesis uh, refers in a strict sense to a rapidly deepening extra topical cyclonic low pressure area. Yeah. <laughs> the weatherman said it today. I'm like, there's no way that's a real word. So I had to look right. at Bom Bombogenesis <laughs> is what we're experiencing here in Rochester, New York, where I'm from. So anything you want to say in closing, just uh, what's your favorite quote? Let's say that motivational quote. Just uh, For me, uh, my favorite quote is uh, the things that unite us are far greater than the things that divide us. Um, and I think 
uh, that plays well into our business as well. I mean, with, with such high tension in uh, politics and different things like that, um, you know, it kind of kind of keep that out of your life, uh, or at least when your your business life. Um, there are certain businesses around in my area that have put up political signs, um, and I know that they've lost business over that. So keeping uh, a focus on the things that are going to um, keep us together, keep us positive towards one another. Um, that's really one thing that I think uh, everybody needs to focus on a little bit better. Um, I have uh, some really great friends that are um, polar opposites of, of me on a political uh, scale, but we get along great because we just keep that part of our, our lives out of our friendship. Um, so um, that definitely is one of my uh, favorite quotes out there. Um, and I use that quite often. Well, and I'm just going to tie it into some of the generational differences that we experience in real estate because oftentimes they're going, you millennials, you yeah. millennials, you, and it's like, it's not you and us, it's, it's us, right? It's not us and them. It's, it's all of us. We should all work together. And like you said, rather than have a river dividing us, let's build bridges to unite us and all work together because we're all in real estate together. The rising tide raises all boats. I say that all the time. Um, Absolutely. And, if you're watching this, feel free to reach out to anybody who's ever been interviewed. All of these folks are really great and they want to help out. That's why they're doing this. We're not making any money all this off of this. We're just we're just doing it to, to help out others and, and make sure that people are successful and they stay in the real estate business. So again, Chris, Chris, thank you so much. I got to come yeah, visit you out there in the, in, in the UP. Yeah, absolutely. Do it over summertime when we're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no doubt. There's no doubt. I think I could take a shortcut through Canada where I am. It's a, it's a, it's a shortcut. It, it could it. be. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure. Well, thanks again for being on the show. And, and again, if you're tuning in millennia who in the comments, you can subscribe to the broadcast, but that's all for now. Make it a great day. Have a good one. You too.